Hi, I'm Dr. Turlop and uh, it's lunchtime. So I'm not gonna talk to you, I'm gonna go have my lunch now. Uh, secretary, can I have my lunch please? Yeah, here. <laughs> Welcome to Lecture 21, everybody. Uh, my name is Art Turlip. Let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about transfer functions. So we've really already hit on these uh, over and over again. Um, we're just going to formalize what we are seeing now and uh, do some examples that utilize the transfer function a little bit. Okay, so recall from before that we had, uh, if we had a convolution happening in the time domain, that we could write this as CT, and uh, if we took the Laplace transform of everything, uh, the Laplace transform of the result of the convolution was equivalent to the result of multiplication of the two inputs that were being convolved. That is to say that basically convolution in the time domain turns into multiplication in the S domain. And we're going to see that the inverse of that is also true. Um, but I don't know if it'll come up in this course or not. But effectively, um, there is a duality here as well. So you could switch S and T here, um, and it would relatively hold true as well. Um, all right, so when we talk about a linear network at rest, we've seen this. Uh, back when we talked about the impulse response, so if this doesn't look familiar or if you're a little rusty or you, know, you had a break in your lectures, um, go back and review this stuff. The uh, H of T here is our network descriptor. It's what we call the impulse response. What's new today is this. This is our transfer function. This is our input but it's the Laplace transform of our input, okay? And this is the Laplace transform of our output. So basically we're just applying a rule here and we're just saying that, hey, things are easier to do in the Laplace domain um, because we know that convolution translates to multiplication. That's it, that's what this whole chapter is about. Um, and, it, and instead of just having uh, two arbitrary things being convolved, we're using that special function and then looking at what its uh, special version is in the Laplace domain. A um, few clarification things, and you know you probably would have already asked this on Piazza or whatever, but um, so when I talk about Laplace space or frequency space, those are synonymous with each other. Um, and uh, when we get to the pull zero plot, we'll talk a lot more about frequency space, but um, I think that's coming up in about two chapters actually. So just hold on, we're getting to the good stuff. Um, but basically, don't overthink it. Um, I think that should do it for, oh, here we go. Well, there's a couple other things I wanted to note here. So when we define H of S, we can define it as follows based on this relationship, okay? So this is equal to Y S over X of S. Oh, I remember what I wanted to say. Um, this is not admittance, okay? <laughs> I know we use Y for admittance and, and it's pretty, uh, well used in the electrical engineering world. But uh, yeah, we have to be careful here. The context is what's going to tell you whether or not we're dealing with an impulse response or an output of a function. Typically, you're not going to see this in, um, you know, past like the initial explanation of what a transfer function is. You're going to have this written out more explicitly. Um, the admittance function may not be written out explicitly. So for example, you might say the output of a system is, you know, e to the minus t, uh, you know, ut or something like that. I don't know. Um, but then you might, you know, you're not going to write ys equals to this. You might just say output um, or something like that. But when you write uh, the admittance, you'll say the admittance, right, is equal to such and such then you will typically see YS, okay? So this is only kind of a placeholder for us because of some old holdover notation. It's, it's unfortunate, but that's what we're stuck with, okay? And the best way to think about this, and this is directly related to what I was just saying, but we think about this more as just Laplace of output over Laplace of input, okay? So we don't really think about things in terms of Xs and Ys. They're just 
placeholders for us. Y S is usually used for admittance. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, we know that, uh, if our impulse, I'm sorry, our, just to formalize this a little bit, H of T is equal to the output when input is delta T. And just to review, um, if we do H of T convolved with a delta function, we get H of T back out, right? Similarly, if we translate this into the Laplace domain, we have H of S multiplied with the Laplace transform of the delta function, and now it becomes very clear why the delta function is this sort of identity to convolution. It's because when we look at it from a different space, it really is just multiplying by one um, in terms of frequency. The other way to think about this is that it's every frequency at the same time, all of the same magnitude. If that doesn't make your head explode, um, you're not paying attention. <laughs> but that's effectively what it is. It's, it's actually um, multiplying by all frequencies the same amount at the same time. Okay? And it's an identity operator. Okay, so let's go ahead and build an example here. Vn of t. I bet you've never seen this example before. Not in a million years. Okay? 100 ohms. 0 0.1 farad uh, capacitor. Our VC is defined here for us, and we have some current ICT uh, flowing down through here. Oh boy, this has not gone away yet. It needs to just die. So sick of seeing it. All right, let's transform this into the Laplace domain, and let, let, at least let's get some new colors going on here. Let's get some green. Maybe maybe it's July by now. I think it probably is actually should be. So we'll do some Christmas in July. Okay. Here comes Santa Claus. Let's go. So I'm going to transform this and the book actually doesn't create this block diagram. I would like to add it in here. Okay. Now this is what we look like. This is 10 over S. And by now you should be able to figure out this equation. We did this last time. Uh, and I think maybe the time before that, but I think it's mostly last time. And, uh, we have 100 ohms right here. Our current coming down is now I, capital I, C of S, and our voltage is now capital V, C of S as well. Okay, so we have an unspecified uh, input to start off here. I'm just going to leave this as uh, V N of S, okay? I'm going to leave this blank for a moment. So we're actually going to derive two different transfer functions here for this circuit, okay? And the first transfer function is going to be related to... Um, right? It's, it's basically inputs versus outputs, right? So we have an input here, right? Oops. Input. And we really have um, two outputs at play. We have VCS and ICS, right? These are my two outputs. There's a relationship between them that we've defined in the past. Um, but by and large, we have two different versions of an output. We're not going to specify our input or our outputs in this because we want to try to establish a relationship between the input over, uh, excuse me, the, let me write it here, the output over the input, right? Because that's our definition of the transfer function. So what we're going to do is derive two different versions of the transfer function. Now in practice, you don't really need to do this. This is more for your own education to see what's going on here. But effectively, once you define the relationship between these two, i.e. the ratio between them, you also get the ratio or relationship between these two, right? Because we know that current and voltage have this nice relationship for time dependent systems or reactive systems, and uh, we have those continuity equations and then their counterparts in the frequency domain. So everything here has already been defined. We're just formalizing the relationships that we're already aware of. Um, and in this case, we don't have 
a specified input or output. We're, we're wanting to build a nice equation like a good mathematician would do um, so that we can use it over and over again uh, for the system no matter what the input-output relationship uh, may be. Or, I'm sorry, whatever the input may be, we'll be able to determine the output. Okay, so what are these two different versions of the transfer function? Well, the first one we're going to examine is with respect to... I don't know why I wrote that. Everyone should know WTR is with respect to. <laughs> if you don't, there you go. Uh, the, uh, now you know. All right, so we have a little voltage division problem here. VCS is equal to ZC of S over ZC of S plus ZR of S, right? And this one is constant with respect to S. We, we knew that going into this, um, right? We have ZR is right here. ZC is right here. Okay, so we know that ZC of S is equal to 10 over S and ZR of S is equal to 100. So we write this equation as follows. We have 10 over S over 10 over S plus 100. This is not quite the nicest form. Um, oh, I forgot. This is a voltage division problem, right? We probably need some voltage here. <laughs> Vn of S. Okay, so this is Vn of S. And we're just going to keep that as a variable for the time being. All right. Sorry, it's a little sloppy. Uh, you can look in your book to follow along. Okay, so we rewrite this equation, and what we end up with is uh, VC. I'm sorry, let's simplify this first. I don't want to do that step yet. Um, so we rewrite this as 10 over, we'll multiply the S through 10 plus 100S, okay, uh, times VN of S. And then this is equal to, we're going to divide uh, top and bottom by, uh, by 100. So we have 1 over 10 over uh, S plus 1 over 10. Now you may be tempted in seeing this form to think, hey, this is one of those nifty sine or cosine functions. Um, it's not because there's no square here, right? And there's no square here. We only get those when we have the square. Okay, so there we have that. Um, the 1 over 10 on the top can fall to the outside easily enough um, because we know that that constant factor really doesn't matter when we're trying to take the Laplace transforms of things. Okay, so let's transcribe this over. C of S is equal to this expression. Uh, what we want to do is write our uh, outputs over our inputs. VC of S is an output. VN I hope you recognize is an input, right? So what we need to do is write the ratio. Uh, it's actually rather trivial to do this. It's a trick we've seen time and time again. One over S plus 10. Notice here that this is just a uh, delay in, a delay, a shift in frequency. Um, and then we have a constant scaling factor over here, which we're going to get to in, I think, about five, six chapters or so, where we do frequency uh, and magnitude scaling. So um, that'll be fun. That, that chapter is a lot of fun. I enjoy that one. It's like a little little game. But um, until we get there, <laughs> um, this is all that's happening. We're just taking the Laplace, uh, inverse Laplace transform of this guy. And uh, let me draw this a little bit nicer. And what we end up with is the following. We have H of S. Notice here that this is equal to H of S now. This is like the whole big deal we've we've been working towards this whole time. And I'm just like, oh, yeah. And by the way, it hits here. Um, there it is. <laughs> That's our transfer function. So for any uh, VC that we uh, have as an output, we can determine VN. Or conversely, for any VN, we can determine VCS. Notice here that this is within the frequency domain. So if we wanted to then figure out what our impulse response is, and you guys remember how much fun it was to figure out the impulse response, right? <laughs> Wasn't that fun? Doing all that convolution, then taking the derivative of the step function crap or the step response? No, that wasn't fun. We didn't like that. We like to do things the lazy way. So, uh... 
then we want to transform this into the time domain, right? Going from S to T to get that impulse response. I, I want to do things the easy way. So I end up with 1 over 10, and we just have E to the minus uh, T over 10. Now, uh, note here that uh, if we didn't want to, you know, write out the impulse response here and then do a convolution every time, we could also take some arbitrary input here and just roll with it from the, um, from the frequency domain perspective. Okay, so suppose then we have V in of t is equal to 5 ut. We'll keep it simple. Then if I take the Laplace transform of this, I end up with V in of s is equal to 5 over s. Then what we do is we just multiply this to hs, which is 1 tenth, 1 over s plus 10, 5 over s. This is equal to hs times v in of s, which is equal to v c of s. So then we do our, our little partial fraction method here, and we end up with, uh, not sure if the reference there is correct, but anyways, it's, it's what we've seen before, and we end up with the same v c t. If you do the work, you end up with uh, v c t is equal to 5 times 1 minus e to the minus t over 10 times u t. And you could either do this in the in the frequency domain or the time domain if you wanted to simplify this using partial fractions or just do the convolution with this guy right here. Either way you want to do it is fine. Okay, so now we need to establish a second transfer function. Um, we don't need to do it. We're actually just going to do it for the sake of argument. All right. And this transfer function is going to be the relationship between a different output and input, which is I C of S over V in of S, right? This is our input output relationship for another transfer function. So I should probably go back and specify here a little bit. So this transfer function, since it's not the only one we could specify, Typically, since it's voltage with voltage, we would just leave it as HS, but we'll go ahead and specify it as HV of S. Okay, this is a special transfer function associated with the voltage. And similarly, here we should probably apply it here as well, right? If you wanted to. So we have two different versions, right? So we did this output already. So now we're going to look at this output. Okay, so what do we get? We have I C of S is equal to V N of S over the total right the total resistance or the total impedance we should say, right? It's not resistance anymore, it's impedance, truly, because we're in the frequency domain. The total impedance of the system. So looking back at our block diagram that we made right here, if I have some current that's flowing through here, right, the total impedance of the system is just the sum of these two resistances. That's from your basic, basic course. So all this is is just the sum of ZC of S and ZR of S, noting here that ZR of S is actually a constant with respect to S. Okay, and then VN is just going to go along for the ride because... Uh, we want to treat it as a variable because we want it to be very able to be anything else. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay. Okay, so at this point, uh, I'm going to actually probably diverge from the textbook here. I, I went through and I checked it over and over again. I think I'm right. I'm never right with respect to Tom, okay, because he, like, never makes mistakes. Um, but I think I got him on this one, so... Let's go ahead and, and, and run this through. If I'm wrong, someone correct me, please. Um, but I think the book has a pretty egregious error towards the end here uh, for chapter, what is this, 24? Um, all right, so here we go. We end up with the following. I'm going to rewrite this expression as I C of S over V N of S. Okay. And for this one, I have 
h i of s, right? And this is equal to just whatever's left over. So this is that z c plus z r on bottom. So z c is equal to 10 over s plus 100. And here's where I think the book kind of screwed up. Um, man, I really hope I'm right. Uh, <laughs> so, yep, if you think you're right about something, just go with it. You know, it's better to put yourself out there and be wrong and take the hit than it is to, uh, you know, let something that is wrong stand by. I, this is actually a good learning point, okay? So when I was in the Air Force, um, there was a reliability method that everyone was using, and it had been around for, I kid you not, 30 years, okay? 30 years they've been doing this. And based on the way that they were collecting the statistics for the system, this method, to me, made no sense, okay? And to stand up in front of generals and, and stuff, you know, or, or your boss or whoever it is in the future is not easy. It's not easy to stand up there knowing that you could be wrong, knowing that you might be stupid. Don't be afraid. It's your job as a scientist or engineer to stand up and say, hey, I think there's something wrong with this. Can we investigate it? Okay. And I, here's what I think is the alternative solution. Always stand up for what you think is right. Whether, you know, uh, especially when it comes to the, the numbers, you're supposed to be the expert. Um, and if something's been wrong for 30 years, maybe it has. Um, and you might be right, but don't be afraid to be wrong. Okay. Don't ever be afraid to be wrong. All right. So I'm not going to be afraid to be wrong against Tom, but, uh, here we go. We're going to multiply top and bottom by S. We end up with S over 10 plus hundred S. And, uh, what I do here is I go ahead and plot a factor of, uh, one tenth from the bottom. So I end up with S over let me pull one tenth out of here. So this is one plus 10 S, right? And so right away, you can see this is different from the book. Um, it's not S plus 10, but one plus 10 S. We have one tenth floating around and I'm actually going to pull that S over to the side as well. Okay. So these, these two factors here are just going to go along for the ride and I have a good reason for doing that. And I'm going to pull out an, an additional one tenth factor here. So this is S plus one tenth now. And then another tenth is out here. Why did I do this? Well, if you recall, this was actually our H V of S. Okay. And so now H I of S, this whole thing is equal to S. I should actually write it this way. One tenth S times H V of S. Why is this important? Well, if we think about our, our relationship between, uh, ICT and versus uh, VCT, right? And what their equivalent should be in the um, in the frequency domain. This makes a lot of sense because this is this one tenth here represents our what do we have? Point one farads, right? This is one tenth uh, that factor that we had for the for the farad the, the capacitor. So anyways, um, yeah, this should work, right? And this S here, what does this represent? This represents the derivative of voltage. So this is actually just a continuity equation. Recall, I C of T is equal to C D D T of V C T, right? And so when we transform this into the Laplace domain, it makes sense that this should be I C of S is equal to uh, C S v c of s and that's exactly what's occurred here so no surprise and then we can use this just like we did um with anything else the book has the example that it goes through and it's like see look it works perfectly <laughs> but i think i think the uh it might be a little little off in there okay it's towards the end so know that it is not correct um so if we follow this through then what we end up with is a bit more of a mess to deal with. And the long story short here for the end of this chapter, guys, is um, use whatever is easiest. So if HV of S is easier transfer function to work with and you happen to have uh, voltages to deal with, go for it. If all you have is currents that you have to deal with or you're asked to find the current, um, then I guess you got to do a little bit of harder work. 
that's the way it goes. Okay. So I think our time spent uh, at this point is going to be more valuable if we do some examples from the homework. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, so we're in chapter uh, 23. Um, we didn't have anything for 22, unfortunately, but these things are going to keep coming up. We talked a little bit about this uh, two lectures ago. That's fine. So let's work through some of these problems, and it'll be a good review to do some of this convolution stuff as well. Okay, for this problem, we have an impulse response here at uh, 2. And uh, one thing to notice right away here is that we have a time delay on the system, right? You can see that from the t minus 3 here. It's delayed by 3. And uh, we're wanting to compute the output of the system for an input of this. So you'll notice here that this input is a composite of a decay function starting at 0 and then a um, t times, so like this little, little spike that depends on the value of t. So this is just at... Uh, 5 is the only place that this actually matters. It's kind of a funky function, really, um, because at t equals 5, this is where this actually pips up and, and gives you a value of 5. Um, as this, if this were to vary, then what you would have here is, you know, these pips that would be dependent effectively on wherever your shift was. So the shift would grow uh, as, it, as it goes through. So this is kind of an interesting function to think about. Um, just in general, outside of the context of the problem. At any rate, um, this is a really good practice problem for dealing with those uh, pesky limits of integration in this problem, and we're going to walk through that. Okay, so here we start off with our classic convolution integral, and we go ahead and evaluate f at tau, and I think that's probably the easiest way to approach this, although you could, you could switch these, right, in terms of which one had tau and which one had t minus tau. Um, but I think because f is a little bit more complicated, it's probably easier to deal with um, as uh, just a tau substituting in for all the t's because it's, it doesn't have, uh, it has more parts than this guy here. Okay, so as we move through, we plug everything in and note here that we are careful to replace the t with a t minus tau here. Okay, otherwise uh, everything else is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and then this problem has also broken up the uh, integral into two parts here. So we just do the convolution of h with this and the convolution of h with this. And we're allowed to do that. We've seen that before. Okay, so what we have for the first part here is we're looking at a function that's running from... Uh, it starts at whenever this thing is equal to 3, right? So when t minus tau is equal to uh, minus 3 is equal to 0. So we want to get a specific value of tau for when this thing turns on. Okay. Well, when would that be? Well, that would actually be at uh, t minus 3, right? t minus 3 equals tau is when this thing turns on. Now, the real question is, is does it go like this? Or does it go like this? So we have to be careful here um, because at first you might see the T and say, oh, well, it should look like this. But actually what, what's really going on here is this is a function of tau, right? And so this track that we're on, as we've discussed before, the track that we're on is the tau track. And so as a matter of fact, it turns on at tau equals T minus three, whatever T may be specified as or whatever T may be. Um, but it's on before that because we have a minus sign in front of tau in this expression here. Let me explain a little bit further. So notice here that this is not uh, tau minus 3, right? If this were tau minus 3, it would just be some uh, step function shifted over by 3. Uh, instead, what we have is t minus tau minus 3, right? Okay, so this is facing the other direction. All right. With that in mind, it's actually quite easy to accommodate this step function within the bounds of our integral. So we go from wherever we started, okay, going ever backwards, all the way from minus infinity up to t minus 3. So our upper bound 
shall ever be t minus 3, no matter what. And so we see that here. Now, as for the lower bound, we have a similar argument, but it's not reversed, right? It's just this u of t, or excuse me, u of tau function. So on the tau track at tau equals 0, as a matter of fact, right? This is u of tau, not u of t. At u of tau uh, equals 0, that's where the jump occurs. And then ever after 0, from 0 to infinity, it is on. And so the combination of these two functions gives us a limit of integration from 0 going ever forward and then stopping at, picks up from over here. <laughs> Sorry, got a little bumped around here. Um, until it hits that t minus 3 marker. And this is great because it enables us, as, as we've seen in the past, normally this goes up to, uh, goes from 0 to t, but it, it, it actually just shifted our function a little bit for us. So no, no big deal. Nothing very strange here. Just follow suit with what the uh, step function is telling you to do. Okay. So the rest of the stuff is pretty trivial. Uh, the, you know, 8 is just 4 times 2, and, and this guy's just carried along for the ride. Let's look at this other integral now. Let me erase some of my junk here. For this delta function, everything is turned off except at tau equal 5. And at tau equal 5, the integral just gets assessed as being equal to 1. And then if you're multiplying stuff to this, the stuff relative to that is constant at that point. So it's just the value of the function, the input function to the integral at five. Well, actually, so that makes this pretty easy. We just assess by doing the, the integral here over d tau. What we're doing with this bit here is essentially saying, um, yeah, that integral is nice and all, but because I have this fancy function in here, I'm only going to effectively give back the output at that value. Let me write it out a little bit more explicitly. If I have f of tau here times delta of tau minus 5 d tau, this is actually just going to give me back uh, f at 5. Because the only place where this is non-zero is at 5. And when I assess the integral with this attached to it, it's just spitting back out that value. This is a very weird integral, but recall that when f of tau was equal to 1, this actually just spit back out the value of 1. So it does make a, a deal of sense. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm pretty confident that you are aware of what this should be moving forward. And we go ahead and continue to simplify this other a uh, little bit less complicated integral on the left side. And uh, we just take the antiderivative here and evaluate it from our limits of integration, no big deal. Uh, you guys know how to do that. There we are, and then we add that other bit to it. Notice we can't combine these very easily um, because of the fact that they're different time shifts from each other. Now, there are ways to kind of try to accommodate this, um, but by and large, I would generally write out any kind of time delay pieces or, or terms independently from each other, okay? All right, so let's look at a Laplace transform method for this very same problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to transform everything into the Laplace domain first and then um, do some partial fraction stuff. And then we're going to come to the exact same output. Okay, so recall that we can, uh, when we apply the Laplace transform, we're calculating it for f of s, we can actually distribute this over addition. And so we can take this piecemeal. And right here we see we have a constant that's just going to float along for the ride times e to the uh, minus 4t. This is a great problem because it's going to demonstrate um, two important concepts for us, which is frequency delay and, and time delay, or frequency shift and time shift, I should say. Delay is not really the right word. Uh, it's a shift. So what we end up with then is when we calculate the uh, frequency shift in the frequency domain, it's just a simple slide over for s. Recall that this minus sign is part of our form, so we have s plus 4 over here. The uh, ut is the original form of the function that is being uh, frequency shifted, fortunately for us. So what we end up with is just the form 1 over s, where this goes, uh, where s, let me write it this way, 1 over s where s goes to s plus 4. 
Okay, that's effectively what's going on. Now, as this function becomes more complicated, you may see that this, this actually becomes a much more uh, complicated function here. For example, with sine and cosine, uh, you could have some of this behavior. And we saw this in one of the problems um, in the past as well, right? Where we had uh, this accounted for in there. Okay, so on this portion then, what we have is t times this delta function. And this delta function has a, uh, a time shift of five. So let's account for the time shift of five first. So we have a time shift of five is accounted for by this uh, doodad right here. And we wanna think about what the, uh, what the value is over this thing here. And when we think about it, this actually only has a value, only non-zero at where? At t equals five, right? So that means that this function is really only assessed oops, at t equals five. And therefore we could really write this as five like, like so, right? Because it's assessing the function here, t, uh, at five. So there's no need for a derivative here, uh, as a matter of fact. So you might think, you see this, you think, oh, this is a derivative form. I have a times a t times a function. Well, no, as a matter of fact, I, I don't need to do that. All I need to do is just think about what it means in the time domain first, and then it becomes pretty trivial after that. So this is just a simple five then, because the only non-zero place for this function is at t equal five. And so there we are. We have a time, sh or excuse me, a uh, yeah, a time shifted five, which looks like a time shift in the frequency domain, which, and this is gonna this is gonna sound weird, but a time shift in the frequency domain, right, looks like a frequency shift in the time domain. Think about that for a minute. So recall that frequency shifts in the time domain look like this. So it's no surprise here that a time shift should look like you know, that kind of frequency shift in the frequency domain. Okay, anyways, uh, enough of the banter. Let's move on. So we go ahead and do our trans, uh, excuse me, our uh, Laplace transform of our uh, impulse response, which is now our transfer function. And we have the same trick here that we had from before. So this is actually, um, so there's an error right there that's completely goofy. What we should have is the Laplace transform of this guy here, 2 ye, two u of t minus 3. 2 u of t minus 3. Okay, this is not bad at all. This should just be 2 with a time, sh or, excuse, yeah, a time shift in the frequency domain. So this is a, a minus 3s. Carries along nicely there. Notice here, just a calm reminder that uh, when we have a minus in the time domain, we still retain the minus in the in the frequency domain, but um, when we have it the other way around, going from a frequency shift in the uh, in the frequency domain, this actually needs to be a plus here. So, anyways, notice we, how we had a plus here, right? Um, we had that frequency shift. So, just be careful of your pluses and minuses. Um, follow those rules, follow those charts, and you'll never go wrong. Okay, and then this is just over the base function. Uh, which has been shifted, right? And that's just S. Notice here that S is by itself. Why? Because we're not doing a, uh, a frequency shift. We've done a time shift, okay? We did a, a time shift. So that S is completely unperturbed. It just has this extra coefficient attached to it, um, just like we had here. So to really bring this point home, right, just because I have this e to the minus 4t here does not mean that I have to have t minus something here, right? These just go together just fine, and they produce a shift like so. Similarly, a shift like this in the time domain has that e form uh, alongside the uh, simple uh, step function, okay? All right, I hope this is helping. Um, if not, just ignore me and, and just do the homework solutions on your own. I don't really care. Um, so what we do is we just multiply these two things together. We have this here, which was the correct answer, just written out wrong. I don't know who did that. Probably me. I think I did that. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, so anyways, we have the, uh, the multiplication occurs here. So this, this gets distributed to each one of these two terms. And this is the form that we end up with. Uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of partial fraction work on that first term. So we do that, we break it up into the two factors, s and s plus 4. And this, recall what we did uh, a couple classes ago, where we just stuff that uh, time shift to the outside. That time shift is going to apply to everything after the fact. Now, we should know, okay, when, when that happened last time, it was not part of this extra term. So we didn't have two things going on at the same time same time, or excuse me, two things going on in the time domain. Uh, notice here that there's actually a composition of two different functions. One has a time delay, one does not. Let's do the partial fraction method. So if we do um, a1 plus, so this, this way actually uses the other way. So let's go ahead and walk through that real quick because this is a great example for that. We're going to write it this way. So s a1 plus 4 a1, okay, plus s a2 all over s times s plus 4. And that's just adding these two things together. You know how to do that. You multiply top and bottom here by s plus 4, multiply top and bottom here by s, add the two numerators together after you've uh, executed the multiplication, and what do you know? Your, your bottom is just those two factors multiplied together. Now, why would I do this when I just you know, wanted to pull them apart. Well, the answer is simple. I'm trying to find those coefficients that go here and here. Okay, so I know now that whatever was up here is equivalent to those two, but before I even did this, I pulled this guy off to the side. So effectively what's left up here is this is 8e to the minus 3s on the outside of 1 over s, s plus 4. So this just has to be equal to 1. Whatever this is has to be equal to 1. Okay, knowing that, then I have uh, s a plus 1, or excuse me, a1 plus a2 plus 4a1 is equal to 1. Well, I don't have any s's here, right? I have 0 s's. So this must be equal to 0, and this must be equal to a quarter. So a1 is equal to 1 fourth, and a1 is equal to minus a2 because of this expression here. So that means that a2 is equal to minus 1 quarter, okay, just as we've shown here. And that's where this, uh, these two expressions are coming from, I guess you could say. There's really effectively two equations because of the, the nature of polynomials. It's quite nice. And so now we can plug in those values for uh, a1 and a2. Notice that this quarter just multiplies, um, and we just have like that negative 1 hanging out, and we just divide out the 8. So we end up with a nice, clean expression here that looks like so. Um, we could try to clean this up a little bit, but as it turns out, and you should recognize this right away, these are two different time shifts here. Okay, so we want to keep them separated. We got to keep those two time shifts separated. And as a matter of fact, I would even separate out these two expressions as well and distribute this uh, over to this guy. Okay, so that's just a recommendation. So as we take the inverse Laplace transform of this, we end up with, um, we can break this apart, right? So let's take this first bit here. Um, we end up, is that right? Is that what I had before? Yes, it is. Okay, just making sure there's no typos. So if I take the inverse Laplace transform of just this part, I end up with 10, and then it's a time shift on a unit step function. Okay, so unit step function, and this shifted by eight. No surprises there. Why? Because I started off with something um, that was delayed by five and then delayed by eight. Or, sorry, delayed by three. So, mm. that kind of actually makes a little bit of sense here. <laughs> All right, well, I can, I can buy that. Um, if I convolve two delays, I, I end up with something um, that's kind of the sum of those two delays. All right. Okay, so we kind of missed this talking about it in the first place. But uh, notice here that when we distributed it, uh, distributed this to the two terms that I have here and here, 
that I ended up with a uh, a new time shift here that didn't exist before because I compounded the two time shifts together. So when you compound the two time shifts together, they simply are additive up in the exponent, which means that our time delays are additive for that particular part. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with right here. That's that's where this is coming from. Um, sorry, I didn't mention that sooner a little bit. My apologies. This is part of the, you know, crap of having to deal with a non-live course. You have a question on something in the lecture. I can't uh, address it right away, but I, I hope I've addressed it. Anyways, uh, what we have here then is just these two uh, functions here and here. I'm actually going to address these up separately. So I'm going to do this one first. So we have uh, 2 times this 1 over s function, which is u, and that u function is delayed by 3. That's it. Okay, and now I'm going to do the same thing, but with this function here. So it's a minus 2 then, and I have similarly a delayed unit step function of 3, but I need to be careful here because I'm also doing something else to it. What else am I doing? Uh, I'm actually uh, doing a frequency shift, right? So if I really want to do this right, what I need to do is make a little bit of room for myself, and I'm going to tack in this extra frequency shift like so. Okay, and when I do that, however, I need to note that this time shift is applied to the entire function, okay? So I still need to make a little bit more room for myself, right? Because what I really have here isn't just a t, it's a t minus three, because everything, everything that, that, that this function touches is time delayed, okay? So this is actually minus four t minus three up here, okay? So a little bit tricky, but it's not too bad, all right? When you break it apart, it's really not too bad. Um, now you say, when do I know, you know, how I'm supposed to delay this, that, or the other? Um, what, what are the order of operations on this thing? Well, there really aren't a nice, clean, specified order of operations. You could probably make one up if you wanted to. Um, but it really is just about the intuition on it. So looking at the intuition here, um, this frequency delay is just a factor, right? And that factor depends on T. So anything that depends on T though, needs to account for any shifts in T. Um, probably first, because those are the most internal thing to the final expression, right? If you're looking internal to the input variable, what, what does the input variable see when it first pops into this expression? Well, it's, it should always see on on these two terms, it should see a minus three next to it. And so you kind of have this, you know, in mathematics, we also have this sort of uh, notion of looking through the circuitry, so to speak, uh, to see what the input variable looks at. Um, now, with that in mind, you know, it, it does that and it has this extra frequency shift attached to this. So um, it gets a little complicated, but you guys can handle it. And, you know, a little bit of trial and error will uh, sort you right out. Just Keep practicing. You'll get the hang of it in no time. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we can simplify this mess. I actually I actually really like it like this because it shows us if we wanted to go back, right? If we did some other stuff here and we wanted to go back, well, I know that's a, a frequency shift. I know there's a time delay. Um, so I like it broken up this way. I actually don't like it broken up this way. So this would be a great way to answer the question. It's like so all neatly broken out, okay? All right, that's that's it. That's this problem. I know it sounded a little bit more complicated probably than just doing the simple integral uh, in this case, but, you know, as those functions get a little bit nastier, it can, uh, it can be a, quite a pain. So, and plus you need to get used to using the... Um, the frequency domain anyway, because there are problems that we just simply can't solve in the time domain. Okay, so for this part, um, we want to solve for the requested output parameter. I'm going to try to do what I can on this one, but I don't think I'm going to have time to answer all of them. 
Uh, this one is of particular interest. You know what? I'm actually going to do this, this one because I think this is the hardest one to do. So let's build our small signal model, which is already kind of done for us, by the way. Um, but what I really want to do here is build the small signal model in the uh, frequency domain. So let's look at the Laplace transform of this. And this is really the, the heart of what we're trying to get at here, right? We're trying to integrate what we knew about before with small signals and apply our Laplace transform methods to it. So 5u of t, this guy becomes what? This is just becomes 5 over s. So let's plug that in here. I'm just going to do one of these numbers here. I don't know if this is correct notation or not. Someone can probably correct me or whatever, but this is a voltage source that we have here. Okay. So this, this could be like your, uh, your VN of, uh, of S, if you want to call it that, that's fine. I have another block here. This is going to be an impedance block of 3K. Then I have another block here. I love these block diagrams. They're so much nicer. Okay. This connects down, and this is important to note here. This is actually VX uh, of S here. <coughs> Right, we've transformed whatever this was Vx of t. It's the Laplace transform of whatever that was. We'll get there. It doesn't really matter what it was, actually, as it turns out. What we care about is what it is in the uh, frequency domain, which is pretty easy to solve because this and this are just impedances for us. So we'll see how that works out. Um, notice here that uh, for... Oh, I, haven't, I don't have any capacitors. Never mind. Or, uh, or inductors, for that matter. So disregard. Okay, so we have a directed current here. Uh, this is 0 0.01 Vx of S. I should put a 0 0.1 there. Oops. Another 2K impedance here. Notice I'm using the word impedance, not resistance, right? Because we're dealing now in the frequency space. Okay, so now with everything that we know, this is I out of S, right? The, the Laplace transform of this. Let's go ahead and solve some of this stuff. So what we're asked to solve for is actually, I'll do this in red so we have some distinction, is this I out of S for this problem. I think that's what we're asked to do. So for this problem, it says solve for these. Okay, so the only thing we have is uh, I out. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, to solve for I out, what we're going to do is first we need to get some information. If I'm looking back on this circuit here, this bit of the circuit, um, what I have is, whoopsies, oh shoot, well, goodbye lecture. What I have, <laughs> I'm never going to find it again. What I, what I really have is uh, this guy here is my, my one limb fac, right? My limiting factor, limb fac, no, nobody. Is I the only one that knows that? All right. In order to find Vx, however, we need to figure out uh, what it is, right? And it comes from over here. So in order to do that, it's if we close our eyes and we squint a little bit uh, or, or squint a little bit, not both, because that would just kind of hurt your eyes, I guess. Um, then we end up seeing that this is just, you know, our old resistor here and a resistor here. This is a voltage division problem with a current or a voltage source. That's pretty easy for us to solve, right? And so as this is a, a voltage division problem, this is just uh, our input voltage Vn S times the voltage division, which is we're going over 2K and then we have the sum of those two resistors that it's going, that the total voltage is going through. And that's just three plus two. So this is just Vn of s times 2 over 5. Well, Vn of s, we know is just 5 over s, right? So this is equal to 2 over 5 times 5 over s. So these two politely cancel, and we end up with 2 over s. Okay, so if Vx of s is equal to then this thing, right? Because we said this was equal to vx of s. If vx of s is equal to that thing, then we just need to multiply that by 0 0.01. So we end up with um, 0 0.02 over s for 
our directed current. Okay? Now we get to do the good stuff. So we get do a little bit of KCL here, right? So I have a current that's coming through this way. It has to match up with the current I get from here and the current I get from here, right? So effectively what I end up with here is 0 0.02 over S, S, it must be equal to the sum of these two. Well, since my, um, my current running through this resistor is the same, uh, has the same resistance here as it does here, these two are in parallel, and so whatever I had here must be half of what I originally had going through in the opposite direction. It's a little confusing. Let's think about it this way. Okay, oops. If I have current flowing through here, right, and I look at this system as being kind of cut off right about here, then what I end up with is this is going to take half of the current from this entire business because I know that these two resistors are equivalent. Therefore, uh, let's write it here. I out of S is equal to minus one half of total current through both resistors. Okay, that said, if I know what the, uh, what the total current is with respect to I out, I can probably write a nice expression for all this. Okay, so that's what exactly what I'm going to do. I have minus I out of S, and I need to multiply that by, um, by 2, right? Because it's twice the amount that I had going through here, but the opposite direction. And that's got to be equivalent to whatever's going this way, right? If I'm looking at this node right here, that's got to be the case. Okay, so now it's just a simple matter of solve for I out. So I out here of S is going to be equal to um, minus 0 0.01 over S. That was a lot of work for... Not very much payoff, but it's really not that complicated, right? So now it has a minus sign attached to it because it's pointing in the wrong direction here for our model. And I say wrong direction, but you get what I mean. So that's it. Now we just transform this back into the, the time domain. And what do you know? It's just minus 0 0.01 U of T. It's pretty easy. Um times a, whatever the heck a is. Why do we have an a in there? Well, I have no idea why there's an a in there. Probably, probably some reason. If anyone knows, you know, send it to me in a letter with some pizza rolls. Okay, I'll eat the pizza rolls and I'll send you back your greasy letter. Bam, problem solved. Okay, I think that's going to do it for today, guys. I'm losing my mind slowly. So, um, you know, this, is, this has been Lecture uh, 21. It's been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. I'll see you later.